Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Key Ingredient Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Sandy Stillwell Youngquest. Sandy is a well-known local entrepreneur, owner of Stillwell Enterprises and Restaurant Group. This group includes a lot of names that we're familiar with, including Captiva Island Inn, Cantina Captiva, Key Lime Bistro, Lati Da Coffee, RC Otters, as well as the Sunshine Seafood Cafe and Wine Bar. Sandy, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome. It's it's a pleasure. Thank you. Did I get all those names correct or yeah. were there any I was missing? No, you sure did. You did just fine. And I have a Key Lime Bistro in Boca Grande now. You do? Okay. So when yeah. did you open that? Very recently or? Just right after Hurricane Ian. Okay. Okay. We're going to have a lot to talk about, Ian, but, uh, but do appreciate you joining us today. If you don't mind for our audience, maybe just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself, please. Well, I grew up here in Southwest Florida and I moved here when I was two from the Chicago area, and uh, it's been my community, went to school here, and uh, I love Southwest Florida. Yeah, it's a, it's a great place to be. You've been here a long time. It's safe to say you've seen certainly a lot of changes yes. all around. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine what it was like when you first moved down here. But uh, So what brought you down here? Your parents moved down here, I assume? or Yes, in the Chicago area, it was the middle of the winter, and they were advertising Cape Coral as the waterfront wonderland of the world. And they uh, they said, okay, let's move here because they're boaters. And they came down the Mississippi River in a cabin cruiser and we settled in Cape Coral. So we were one of the original uh, families in Cape Coral. Wow. So what was Cape Coral like when you came down here? I'm assuming, I mean, there weren't anywhere close to the number of homes there are now. It's amazing. It was barren with lots of canals and uh, more alligators than people. <laughs> <laughs> changed quite a bit, hasn't it? It certainly has. And we moved away later on. Uh, I just was driving through that area yesterday. I was going to, down to Matt Lachey, and I just couldn't believe Cape Coral, how huge it is now. It really is. And it's still growing quite a bit, as is everywhere down. Obviously, a lot of people want to move down here to this area. And you're in a great business for that, obviously, uh, which I look forward to getting to. So let's maybe let's go back a little bit, if you don't mind. Let's talk about your childhood. What did your parents do? What was your childhood like? Well, my father worked for the land development company, and he always had a dream of owning his own hotel. And I always knew that we were we were definitely very frugal family, and we were saving for something. And then when I was twelve, they announced that they had just bought a property at Fort Myers Beach and were building, uh, you know, the hotel. So they built, which was it turned into the Ramada Inn. Back then, it was called the Eventide, and now it was just torn down for the Margaritaville. So if you get the bearing oh. of the Ra Margaritaville at Fort Myers Beach, that's what the hotel was. So it's right there. So okay, so you were a child. Your dad wanted to to start this hotel. What was the hotel like? Was it was it a large hotel? Was it smaller? What was what was it? Like? It was three stories, uh, around forty units, and um, and I was the built-in unpaid maid, <laughs> no elevator, <laughs> up and down the stairs, and then I eventually graduated to work in the front desk. But I really enjoyed. Um, that business, I, I really did. And I knew someday that I wanted to own my own hotel. Yeah. So, all right. There's a lot to unpack there. So you grew up in a hospitality business and, and I knew that and I wanted to get to that a little bit. So um, bring me back then to at what age were you were you helping out at the hotel? When did that start? Well, it was 13. By the time we had it built, it was 13. But I had already started working in my uncle's restaurant across the street okay. as a dishwasher when I was 10. I would help him out because I he needed help and I, I was wanting to help him. And uh, he he swore that I, you know, broke more dishes than I washed at first. And <laughs> Did he make you pay for them or no? No. Okay, no, well, no. that's good. But but I found that I really liked the restaurant business in working with people, but I saw how hard he worked and I said to myself, I would never own a restaurant because that was just way too much work. Well, so is the hotel business, right? I mean, I don't think, yeah. uh, you know, for most of us who dream about wanting to own a restaurant or a hotel or whatever it may be, I mean, there's a lot of work in both of those. Um, so I guess so. Okay, so you did that, and then you decided. Then you ended up working right across the way at, at, at your parents' place. So what what were you doing? You said you were doing kind of maid services. Is that yes? Well, okay. you know, back then, you know, it was there were ten motels that were built at the same same year, and okay. uh, so we were renting rooms literally for twelve dollars a night. If you can think back, my father would stand out on the road and like wave people in. You know, it was really <laughs> something. And so we did everything that we could just to help it, you know, keep that business going. We were supposed to open at the beginning of the season, but construction was held up. So we didn't open up until the end of season. So we knew if we could just get it through that one season, we'd have it made. And so that's what we, we ever, you know, we did everything without any help. We wow. everybody chipped in. What, um, I don't want to date you, so I won't ask, I won't ask uh, years, but what was the what was the hospitality like 
business down here at that time? Were there a lot of people actually wanting to come down to Southwest Florida at that point? You know, there it was more winter based. You know, summers were so dead. And yeah. that's if we have become more year round, even though we do have our season, but there are more residents here now. And I think Florida Gulf Coast University changed the whole dynamics of our whole area, uh, having the whole university system in here and the growth that we've experienced since that time. But tourism was entirely different back then. And it's interesting to have seen it change. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. And it keeps evolving. Um, so, okay. So you were doing that. So you, you, you were able to get the experience in both the restaurant business and the hotel hospitality business. So bring me a little further down there. So you were obviously, you were, you were a kid, you were going to school. Um, you said you went to school down here the entire, you stayed within the state for mm -hmm. all, all years of, of schooling. Yes. Okay. And so when you went to, did you go to college? You went, not okay. originally. Okay. I went later. Okay. So you went later. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you were getting hands-on experience anyway. So at what age did you decide, and it might've been way at the beginning, that you want to be in this type of business? Well, probably when I was 15. Okay. And uh, when I was 17, I went into my own business. I started my own business and uh, I still worked my parents a little bit on the side and ran the business. And that was kind of to get me jump started into what I really wanted to do, which again was owning a hotel. Okay. So 17 years old, yes. let's go back to Sandy at 17. So what, what business did you open? What were the, what, what, what were you thinking at that time? Well, I was helping, um, in my church and I was in a youth group and i and then I was in a Bible study. And then I found out from, uh, one of our bankers that he needed help cleaning and I already knew how to clean motel rooms, so I figured <laughs> sure. I could do that. And uh, so we had a, 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 another partner, and we started a small business, and we cleaned banks at night. And so it was it was easy cleaning because banks at night, you know, it's not really messy work. It's not like we did have a, another avenue of our business that was construction cleanup, and I quickly shut that one down. That's <laughs> tough business. So you specialized up. in in banks? Is that so that okay. was our yes? We did other things as well, but anyway. So then. Um, Eventually then sold that business and uh, moved on and bought a, a partnership in a, in a small inn, which is still there. And it actually made it through Hurricane Inn, my first inn. Did it still, really? Still well, let, let me let me stop you there, if you don't mind. So mm -hmm. at 17, you started this cleaning business for banks. Mm -hmm. At what age did you sell that business? Oh, well, I was 19 and was 20, I guess. Okay. 20, and then uh, 21, got the hotel. It was, a, okay. you know, I mean, honestly, it was a tad bit of a flea bag hotel, you know, I had to fix it up a lot. And, um, but I lived right there, you know, ran it. And, um, it just so happened that the timing was really right because within about, uh, two years, I had an offer from an interval interval ownership company that wanted to buy me out. Really? So, yes. And so, uh, and that, that got my, that was the one thing that got my start, you know. So you sold, so that was your second business that you mm -hmm. sold by what age is this? About I was 20, 22. 22. Yeah, so you said, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was 22, almost 23 when that happened. Wow. So most people by the age of 22, 23 did not sell two businesses, right? So that's pretty interesting. So you, okay. So you sold that. Um, so now you sold two businesses. So then what, what did you go into next? Well, I went into property management and I met the gentleman that owned the real estate company that brokered the deal to the interval ownership company. And his name was Jim Newton and he had Newton and Associates. He was quite well known in our area in that he was friends with Thomas Edison. Wow. Uh, Charles Lindbergh was the best man in his wedding. He was friends with Harvey Firestone and Henry Ford. <laughs> And he was much older than me. You know, here I was in my early 20s and he was in his 60s and his wife, Ellie. And uh, so uh, I helped them with their property management company. They did really well on selling real estate. They just needed somebody to help run the logistics of the property management. So again, a partner and I, we went in and uh, we ran that. And then he sold the company uh, several years later to a large national franchise. And so then I, I went back off on my own owning individually owned hotels again. So, well, okay. So what was the first hotel you bought after that? So what was that like? Was it a smaller hotel? And it was another smaller okay. hotel. And it was a, it was a sacrifice on my part because I had, we had invested in quite a few condominiums and that was about the time that the interest rates were going up, 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 very similar to what's going on right now, yeah. except back then they went up all the way to 23%. So it was really hard if you bought a pre-construction, you know, a condo 
to make much of a profit if the interest rates are going to be that high carrying it in the meantime before you sell it, et cetera. So uh, we kind of cut back on our lifestyle, realized that maybe that big house that we had, we hmm. could do without. So again, um, and by that time I was married and I had my first child. And um, so we sold that house and bought a hotel and moved right in and started back over again. And it was like, you know, two steps forward and one step backwards. But sometimes in life, that's what you do. You kind of have to do, make sacrifices to your personal lifestyle to help. If you're really, really centered on making something of yourself, it's not always what people, you should not worry so much about what people think of you, but really know what you think of yourself. I, we should stop there because what you just said in the last 30 seconds, I think people need to listen to again. A couple couple things I want to mention. First is anyone under the age of probably 30, 35 would probably cringe hearing you say 23% interest rates, right? Because we think they're so high now and they are, of course, but um, obviously, as you said, rates were a lot higher. But the key with you, what, what I my takeaway from what you said was that's the entrepreneur lifestyle, right? I mean, not only do you take risks, but there are certain times where not everything always goes your way. Right. And sometimes you need to make modifications and adjustments to your lifestyle in order to be able to continue to have that kind of success. And I think that's really important. Well, thank you. And I do think that when people see you do that, they realize that you're authentic. And most importantly, I think people want to see authenticity in people and not worrying about what everybody's thinking of you. Yeah. You know, and being able to sleep at night and feeling good about yourself, to me, that's the most important thing that drives me every day is the way I walk. A absolutely. Wow. That's uh, Thank you for saying that. I think that's very powerful what you just shared. So um, just to stay on track here. So you bought you, you bought this hotel. So how many others did you buy after that? Well, that one, I, I actually franchised it with a small chain and sold that. And then after that, I bought um, my place on Captiva, Captiva Island Inn, which was the smallest little inn that I've ever had. But I just absolutely fell in love with it. You're not supposed to fall in love with an investment <laughs> That's a big property. rule there, it's right? It's a big rule, yeah. you know. But it just, it was like, wow, I love this place. And it was tiny. And, uh, but I, from that, it spring, it, I used that as the springboard to buy some other properties there on Captiva. So it didn't, it just started off with one small little inn. Wow. Wow. So how much, so how integral was your dad, I guess, in this as well? Because you, it sounds like you had, I mean, you had a terrific, obviously mentor um, available to you to kind of learn the ropes, so to speak. So, I mean, what, how instrumental was he? Oh, and he still is. Yeah. He, he's okay. in his nineties now and very instrumental and my grandparents because they were entrepreneurs as well. And my uncle was an entrepreneur. So we just grew up in a family of very hard workers. We didn't sit around. I'm going to tell you, we <laughs> never sat around. And we were very frugal in our living, in our entire lifestyle. But my father, uh, you know, I was kind of his built-in unpaid maid when, when I, he was struggling through getting his hotel going way back. And it was there was payback time because when I bought this little inn on Captiva, it wasn't large enough to even have a maintenance man. So he would drive out and he'd have his little toolbox with him and he'd do all my repairs for me. And we, we became very close and we've always been close. That is absolutely terrific. Um, yeah. I mean, to learn things like franchising and um, obviously things in, you know, I don't know too much about the business, but, but even just, you know, leverage in general, borrowing money, learning how to run a business. I mean, that not everybody knows how to do, I mean, that's, there's a lot there. So uh, a lot of learning involved. I'm sure you could probably teach a, bunch of courses yourself on on how to do things like that so once once you so once you had bought that that captiva uh, in um what was that like was business was business good right from the beginning or what was it like you know i did i bought a, a business that was already going the people that had it had fixed it up so it was a charming little bed and breakfast inn with little cottages and it had a restaurant and they were the a landlord to the restaurant. So it, you just leased it out and collect rent every month. Okay. And I didn't really know anything about the restaurant business um, prior to when I had this other hotel that I had. And uh, in the meantime, I had an opportunity to buy a hotel on Vanderbilt Beach before I bought the place on Captiva. And it was right on the beach and it was lovely. It was, I, I could afford it. It was just myself without any partners but the hotel part um, did very, very well. The restaurant part lost every bit and then some. And so I really felt like I couldn't buy that because I really didn't know the restaurant business. So that's when I went to school and studied food and beverage management as a single mom. Did you and, really? Yeah, so I Where did you do that? Was it FGCU? Or? Uh, no, Cornell. Okay. Oh, very and, nice. And, uh, and I, my 
kids at that time were uh, were teenagers, uh, young, you know, adolescents and teenagers, yeah. two boys. So uh, my sister would watch them some, my brother would watch them some, my mom and dad, and uh, we, you know, had the, had the summer of my flying back and forth to New York and yeah, Ithaca, yeah, yes, yeah. and it was it was great. But it, I, mean, I want to be fast to say it was not the full four year degree. It was a certification in hospitality and specifically in restaurants and understanding the accounting and the marketing and the whole planning of restaurants. That was my goal. So I could buy a hotel that had a restaurant and I would know how to do it. Wow. Well, Cornell, I don't know if everyone knows this. Obviously you do, but this, the school of hotel, hotel management and hospitality is, is well, well regarded. So you went to a, an absolutely great place to do that. So um, excellent. Good for you. It's, it probably was not easy to make that transition maybe later in life to be able to do that. So I think that's that's terrific. You mentioned, I want to go to things that entrepreneurs deal with, right? You mentioned mm -hmm. obstacles already. Um, whether it's scaling back your own lifestyle or dealing with the seasonality, um, but there are obviously a lot of other obstacles and challenges. Uh, two big ones that I could think of right now that we both know. The first, going back only a few years ago, was COVID. So how did COVID impact your business? Hugely. It was amazing. I think we all just sat back kind of numb that this could happen. And I remember when, when the word got out and it said we might be closed down for as much as a year or something. And then someone said, maybe it could be two years. And I was going like, no, there's no way that this could possibly happen. But everything did initially close down. And I I'll always remember that in March, we had all kinds of charity fundraisers planned. Everybody, everything came to a screeching halt, you know. And uh, then all the businesses shut down. And that was in March. But, you know, it was I was so pleased that our governor helped open things up a little bit quicker than we had expected, which was very helpful. And so by about, if I recall, it was right around Memorial Day, just going into June when we started being able to open up with half, you know, 50 percent seating. Or at first it was just all to go. You know, there were all these different sure. stages and everything. But in the restaurant business, at least we had some kind of cash flow coming in. I never... Uh, let go of any of my employees initially. I just, you know, our business was so very busy that it was hard to find times to do the cleanup. You know, so Key Lime Bistro, we took that time to take every single piece of equipment out of the kitchen, painted, we put, redid the floors, we, you know, did all kinds of things. So I kept them on the payroll. And uh, then the PPP money came in later. But, sure. you know, that first six weeks, I never got paid back for that. But, you know, I don't regret that because I still had my staff. So when we were open, I didn't have to grab all the people back again. They already were there for, for me and working. And I think when you you show commitment to your staff, they will show commitment back to you. Yeah, there, there's loyalty involved in that. And you obviously showed that and it gets reciprocated. So yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that was a big deal for any business, but obviously certainly yours. And that's why I wanted to mention that. So as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, there were a lot of decisions you had to make. Um, I would think like most, and it sounds like it, it, it was the case for you, but your employees taking care of your team is is obviously the most important thing. But um, and like you said, fortunately, the you know, the timeline you said was only about 90 days from that March to uh, to Memorial Day. So fortunately, things were getting now. Did you find you started getting getting fairly busy during COVID? Because a lot of people I know were coming down to the state. You know, the idea that we had the little individual cottages as part of the inn worked out to my benefit. Sure. And by that time, I had. I bought the place across the street and I built two more buildings. And so it had expanded from, you know, one little inn to other rental homes, et cetera. And so it was great because, you know, people didn't want to check in to a big hotel that had an elevator that you were constantly around a lot of people. Instead, they could, you know, rent a little cottage. And if they didn't want to come to the restaurant, we would bring their food to them. And so it was, you know, people loved it. That's actually, so that, that was perfect. Like you said, that was a great business move that you had that because it fell right into COVID and what you needed at that time. So um, very interesting. So, okay, so you got through COVID. Um, occupancies, I'm sure, you know, went, went right back up again. And, uh, and then, of course, unfortunately, we had Hurricane Ian, which in, in, in your area um, was, was pretty heavily affected. So what was that like? And this was not your first hurricane. No, it wasn't my first hurricane. As a matter of fact, uh, Hurricane Charlie, I never evacuated Captiva. And so I was right there at my house next to the Key Lime Bistro. And wow, that was something. But we didn't have the storm surge. So although we had the wind and everything was broken and shut down for a while and I built it back up again, it 
wasn't as devastating as Hurricane Ian, who, which came in with that high storm surge, everything flooded. And um, so it's been a bit of a, everything's been shut down since Hurricane Ian. I just now got R.C. Otter's, my family restaurant, open. It's on Andy Rossi Lane. And we just had the ribbon cutting last week. I was going to say, that was just last week. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And so, uh, and it's been very busy, but still, even as busy as it is, when I compare it to, to numbers of years previous, it's still down. Okay. So the group of our, you know, other restaurant owners, we've been getting together and we just got some, a toll abatement that the county commissioners uh, agreed to yesterday. So it's very thrilling for six weeks, starting this Sunday, there is no Sanibel toll on okay. Sundays. Wow. And then we got some private funding. We're working toward maybe a Saturday abatement, as long as private funding can come in through the collaboratory in, in Fort Myers. It's a nonprofit charity. Sure. And, sure. um, so we think that we have that. And because, you know, there are many restaurants that actually opened up maybe a month or two ago and talking with them, it's been negative cash flow. So although they were so excited to get open, there is not enough customers to keep it going. Yeah. So when we say when you come out to the, you know, to Captiva and Sanibel, don't take your coolers with you. Please stop at the island restaurants <laughs> and keep them alive. So that way in the winter, they'll still be around because it's going to be a long rest of the summer until the season hits. Well, and like we said, this is still a seasonable place to live, right? It's changed quite a bit, but it still is in, uh, this is a tough time of year, uh, obviously for that. So really in the course of a two year span, you do, you dealt with COVID and you dealt with the hurricane. And uh, so with the hurricane it was the same, same type of story as far as your staff and, you know, it was kind of like the story all over again. Yes. And, then, uh, but I did, I had already signed a contract to buy what used to be the loose caboose on uh it's in Boca Grande. It's okay. the, in the historic train station. And I wanted to create another Key Lime Bistro. So I was due to actually close on it the day that Hurricane Ian hit us. Wow. But, you know, the insurance companies won't write new policies when there's a name storm out there. So I had to put it off for a couple of weeks. And then by the time that couple of weeks came along, I pretty much knew everything on Captivo was really in dire need and was going to be a long time before I could get it back open. So I had to really think about whether I should close on this deal or not, or just lose my deposit. And, um, but I prayed about it and I really thought, Hey, you know, I've got all this management staff right now. I need to all hands on deck. So the, pretty much that everybody moved then, you know, they would drive every day to Boca Grande. My entertainers, they needed work too. They were driving to some of my servers the chef, everybody moved there. And so I had a, you know, I had an avenue to actually employ them. And then other people we were cleaning up and, you know, doing all the disaster cleanup and stuff. So, and we're still doing it every day. Wow. Uh, unbelievable. And uh, hopefully that's it for a while, because obviously we live in a place where unfortunately hurricanes are just part of the price we pay to live here. But um, yeah. So if you compare Charlie to, cause I wasn't down here for Charlie, mm -hmm. Charlie to Ian, I know you mentioned the storm surge. What, how would you compare the two? Well, it was so much larger and it just hovered forever. At least with Charlie, it went through and the eye of the storm went right through Captiva. Yeah. So um, with this, it just lingered for so long and brought so much water. Sure. And then it knocked out our entire Sanibel Bridge. So then again, they were saying two years for our bridge to be open. <laughs> And, uh, and again, our governor pulled through. For I was going to say, so what was the timeline? So they said two years. How long did it take? Right about a month. Is it now, I don't think people can really comprehend that when you really think about that, that two years it was expected and it took about a month, which he, is unbelievable. And, you know, yeah. and, and he called and, you know, his team, he, he personally didn't call his, somebody from his team called, checked to see, you know, what can we do for you? And I, I said, get that bridge open. I don't care what, we, <laughs> you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat, we have, we need our, our bridge. Sure, you know, you it doesn't can matter. Show, yeah. You can show what a leader you are. And he just cut through the red tape, got it open. And uh, now the permanent ones being under, you know, right now the construction is going on. You can still go through. The only thing they don't allow is bicyclists because it's too dangerous for them sure. right now. But you can, you know, take your bike on the back of your car or rent one when you get there. There's Billy's Bicycle Rentals. <laughs> and I'm always pumping and helping my other fellow entrepreneurs on the island. I think that's great. I think that's important. What are your, what's your favorite part of being an entrepreneur? You know, being able to call my own shots. You know, I mean, I, you always are, you know, I'm so... I'm accountable to God and my bankers. Okay. So okay, those, those two okay. things, but pretty much call my own shots. I love that. You yeah. Know? So the flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I plan on growing, you know, I do when the, when the RSW has their new tr terminal that opens next year, mm -hmm. I'll have a Keyline Bistro there in 
The Are airport. you really? Okay. Yes, I'm very excited about that. So that's already in the works and being set up. Yes, it's been it's been going on for a couple of years now. So uh, I'm just excited to see it happen. And uh, so I think the Key Lime Bistro chain is something that I might consider making larger. We'll we'll just have to wait and see. So will that be your second location then that in the airport? The okay, third. that'll be a third. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. So that'll be the third. So mm -hmm. there could possibly, and I was going to ask you what your vision is for the future, but let's just go right into that. So um, you're thinking maybe franchising it or just opening up I a could, whole bunch of I could franchise okay. it, and I'm exploring that right now. But, you know, I really want everything operating pristine right now and my focus is getting the one on Captiva back open again because well, sure. that was the mothership you know <laughs> and of course I get of that course one going and I did promise for the songwriters festival that is in September I'd have it open and uh boy it's you know every day it's nip and tuck I might have a food truck parked around the back but uh, in the front it'll look good anyway because you know when you promise that you're going to do something I'm, I'm going to do it you know? well absolutely you mentioned food trucks have you thought about doing something like that because that's obviously becoming a very very popular thing these days well it's funny that you mentioned that because i bought one and so at uh, right at new year's okay. in front of the in front of the mexican cantina because it's so easy to fix mexican food in a food truck sure. if you're into the fine dining or any it's hard but with mexican food it's easy so we've had it's called rico suave's Food truck. Farms, <laughs> Great name, right? Rico Suave. He, that's okay. my dog's name. It's actually my son's dog's. We have joint custody of, of the Chihuahua. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Rico Suave is quite the little man, is all Love I can it. say. Yes. Wow. So, okay. So that is something you're looking you're looking to do, the food truck business. Yes. And, you okay. know, we'll probably put that one on the road. Okay. Wow. Interesting. So what um, so what are the visions do you have? I mean, obviously, you I could tell already you, you think big, right? You're not you have a great portfolio of, of of restaurants and hospitality, but it sounds like you're thinking about the next move. So you can have the RSW location. Um, what else? I mean, is there any any other hotel? Hotels coming up, or are you shifting the business to some degree? Well, right now I have to tear down most of my cottages at the Captiva Island Inn, and so I'm underway right now getting approvals for the new, you know, Captiva Island Inn, which will be very much like the old one, but uh, but newer and and improved. So uh, you know, everybody wants a little bit more space these days. So sure. the cottages will be just a bit bit larger, but just as quaint as ever. Okay. Interesting. So I did ask you what your favorite part of being an entrepreneur. So I now have to ask you what's, what's your least favorite? Oh, the unknown, you know, and knowing you're flying out there on your own. I mean, it's, you know, I don't have a bunch of partners or anything. It's, it's just me, you know, and then on one of my, the Bimini Bait Shack, uh, it's on the way to Sanibel mm -hmm. on the right, just by the Sanibel Harbor Marriott. I own that with a partner and, uh, but pretty much everything else is just me. Okay. So what are your days like? I mean, you must have a pretty busy schedule or do you find good ways to really kind of have a routine and uh, do you have work balance? And what does that look like? You know, work balance is very important and I'm very involved in the community with charity work. I just love that. And so um, that's, that is my way of giving back to the community. And, you know, the, having the restaurants has given me the platform to be able to do this because a lot of times it might be at a soup kitchen event, bringing in food you know, there a lot of times it's food related. So we can, you know, whether we give gift certificates or we put on dinners or events, the restaurant has helped me in that way. And then, um, and I've, I've really enjoy uh, supporting different candidates that are running for office and things. I find that interesting. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll ask you a tough question. So your dad, because obviously I could tell he had, he, he still has a very big impact in your life. What would you say is the number one thing that your dad taught you about life or business in general? just to work hard and never give up, you know, and really that is, that is really the biggest thing with him. I've just watched him work so hard. And, uh, and so he, you know, always he had a, a nickname for me, his dandy little Sandy. And so, you know, I was always his helpmate, no matter what happened, I was there to help him. I love it. I love it. Excellent. Well, listen, this was great. Um, you have a great story. Um, I appreciate you sharing with me. You're a well-known name down here. So for a lot of people, they might not know the background. And I use this as a chance to be able to share that with everybody. So uh, so this is great. Any Anything parting you want to leave us with um, or any advice really to entrepreneurs listening? Well, you know, I do mentor quite a few different entrepreneurs or, or that want to be. And then just keep, you know, keep focused on your dream and don't give up. Love it. Love it. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much. Appreciate all that you do for, for the community and appreciate you being on the Key Ingredient Podcast. And I wish you continued success. Thank you. Thank you.